This topic is about breathing pattern disorders and the four phenotypes of obstructive sleep apnea. Traditionally, obstructive sleep apnea was always seen as an anatomical issue. The airway was too narrow. So its suction pressure created during breathing was causing collapse of the upper airways. Now in recent years, researchers have identified four different phenotypes. And these four phenotypes are P-crit, which is the pharyngeal critical closing pressure. Loop gain, which is the stability of ventilatory chemo reflex feedback control. The third one is called arousal threshold, and that's basically the negative intraesophageal pressure that triggers arousal. And the fourth then is upper airway recruitment threshold, the level of stimulus required to activate the upper airway dilator muscles. Now I'm going to go through each one in pretty much in detail, but I will keep it simple. Because in actual fact, the four phenotypes, they're very simple, and all four phenotypes, breathing pattern disorders, plays a role with. So the first one that we're looking at is PCRIT. And PCRIT is the air pressure at which the passive airway collapses. And it's considered to be the gold standard approach to quantifying functional anatomy during sleep. Now already I said that traditionally, um, obstructive sleep apnea was always considered mainly to be an anatomical issue. But now there are three non-anatomical issues. But of course, PCRIT is primarily anatomical. So PCRIT is basically asking how much suction pressure is required to cause collapse of the upper airways. And when we consider obstructive sleep apnea, it's the ability of the upper airway dilator muscles to keep the airway open versus the negative pressure created during inspiration. And collapse of the upper airway will occur when the negative pressure created during inspiration exceeds the dilating force of the upper airway dilating muscles. During wakefulness, our airway stays open, but during sleep, the airway can collapse. And airway is really, we need our airways to be able to withstand high suction pressure. Whereas if we have airways that are collapsing at a low suction pressure, then there's going to be a problem. Now, can we change that? Yes. If we have an individual who's breathing hard and fast during sleep, the hard and fast breathing is increasing the negative pressure in the airway and that is going to predispose to collapse. My role is with breathing re-education is to reduce and normalize breathing volume and thereby with lighter breathing there's less negative pressure in the upper airway and there's less predisposition towards collapse. Factors that influence collapse of the airway include of course fat deposition so as we get older there's a tendency maybe to put on a few pounds and we have increased fat in the tongue, so the tongue is occupying more space in the mouth. We also have increased fat depositions in the throat. This is going to make the airway more narrower. And of course, we have increased fat deposition in the tummy. So if we have fat on the belly, our diaphragm doesn't work as effectively as it should do. During inspiration, our diaphragm is moving downwards by about one to two centimeters during rest. But with fat on the belly, it compresses the ability of the diaphragm to move downwards. Diaphragm movement is very important with obstructive sleep apnea because our diaphragm muscle is directly linked with the upper airway dilator muscles. When we use our diaphragm muscle in breathing, the upper airway dilator muscles work more effectively. But if there's fat on the belly, diaphragmatic movement is impaired, and as a result, the upper airway dilator muscles aren't doing their job effectively. Other factors influencing when we're looking at breathing, we have to consider the Bernoulli principle. And the Bernoulli principle states that as fluid flows, the negative pressure develops at the periphery of the flow. And that as the flow velocity increases, so does the negative pressure. Well, that's really when we're considering breathing. So when we are considering upper airway and diameter of the upper airway, we also need to consider flow. And flow is the amount of air that we're taking in and out of our lungs. Normally during an apnea, the individual has an inspiration, they have an expiration, and then they have airway collapse. In order to reduce the risk of obstructive sleep apnea, we want to reduce flow, but we also want to increase the diameter of the upper airways. So PCRIT is the pressure at which the airway collapses. We want the airway to be able to withstand a high suction pressure. Then the airway dilator muscles are doing their job effectively. The second principle or effect that we're talking about in terms of obstructive sleep apnea is the Venturi effect. And this also has relevance, of course, with PCRIT. 
The Venturi effect is that as a given volume of fluid flows through a conduit of decreasing diameter, the velocity of the fluid will increase. Now the best way to think about this is that if we have narrow airways, it increases negative pressure. And you could think of it this way. If you were watering your garden with a garden hose, if you want to increase the pressure of the flow, you choke the hose. So by reducing the diameter of the hose, you increase the pressure and you see that the water will flow further. So bring the two things together. It's not just about the anatomy, but it's also about the flow. So Bernoulli principle and the Venturi effect. Bringing the two together shows us the link between breathing pattern disorders and obstructive sleep apnea. Another factor in terms of peak crit is called the Starling resistor model. And basically this states that if there's an obstruction upstream, so for instance, if the nose is stuffy, it causes increased negative pressure downstream, so there's, the throat is more likely to collapse. And there's four places at which the throat will collapse. Number one is that the soft palate is falling against the back of the throat. Number two is that the tongue is falling back into the airway. Number three is the epiglottis is falling back into the airway. And number four is that the throat itself is collapsing. Now, this is really where nasal breathing and mouth breathing comes in. And I probably mentioned this a couple of times, but our tongue has two places to be. Our tongue is either resting in the roof of the mouth with three quarters of the tongue elevated into the roof of the mouth, or the tongue is falling back into the airway. With mouth breathing, it's not really possible to have the tongue resting in the roof of the mouth. So therefore, if the individual is breathing through the mouth, both during wakefulness and also during sleep, the tongue is falling back into the airway and the airway then is anatomically it's narrower and it's more predisposed to collapse. A good airway is the size of your tongue. So we don't have a whole lot of room for air. It's about 1.2 centimeters or about a half an inch. A poor airway is about the size of a pen. So it's quite narrow. And if the airway is that narrow, we really need to be doing what we can do to make the most use of the airway that we have. So a closed jaw and proper dental occlusion will stabilize the flow in the upper airways. And mouth breathing, the tongue falls into the airway, narrowing the pharyngeal lumen and increased oscillation and vibration of the soft palate and redundant tissue of the pharynx. So these are the points that I just made earlier on. The second phenotype that we're looking at is loop gain. And again, breathing pattern disorders are going to play quite a significant role with this. Aside from anatomical compromise, arguably the strongest determinant of obstructive sleep apnea is a hypersensitive ventilatory control system or elevated loop gain. It sounds a little complicated, but it's actually quite simple, which I will explain in the following slides. Approximately one third of people have high loop gain. So during sleep, as well as during wakefulness, the primary stimulus to breathe is carbon dioxide with oxygen playing a lesser role. It's really only when our oxygen levels drop by half do the peripheral chemoreceptors kick in and oxygen therefore is driving breathing. So during our normal regular breathing, the central chemoreceptors in the brain are monitoring primarily carbon dioxide. Now people with high loop gain, they have an exaggerated response to minimal changes in carbon dioxide. So what does that mean? It means that if, for example, the individual stops breathing during sleep, as they stop breathing during sleep, carbon dioxide is going to increase in the blood. If the chemoreceptors in the brain have an exaggerated response to the accumulation of carbon dioxide, it means that when the individual resumes breathing, the individual is going to resume breathing with quite large ventilation. And what that in turn is going to do is going to cause too much of a loss of carbon dioxide. Now, we said already that the primary stimulus to breathe the neural drive to breathe is carbon dioxide. So if you have an individual who is hyperventilating, as a result of breath holding, the hyperventilation now is going to cause too much of a loss of carbon dioxide. This in turn, the brain is not going to send the message to breathe, so the obstructive sleep apnea in turn is contributing to a central sleep apnea. Where does breathing re-education come in? We teach breathing exercises to reduce the ventilatory response to carbon dioxide. Individuals with a strong ventilatory response to CO2 have high loop gain. And what we want to do is we want to practice breathing exercises during wakefulness and that in turn will carry through to during sleep. So as we see in the diagram here, 
We have the individual, they stop breathing, the airway collapses during sleep, so they have an obstructive sleep apnea. And as they are stopping breathing, carbon dioxide is increasing and blood oxygen saturation is going to drop. If they have a high loop gain, it means that when they resume breathing, their body is going to react with a strong ventilation in response to the accumulation of carbon dioxide. So the individual then resumes breathing with gasping of breath and they take large breaths of air into the lungs, but this in turn is going to get rid of too much carbon dioxide. And now the brain is not going to send a signal to breathe because the neural drive to breathe is reduced as a loss of too much CO2. So basically we have individuals with high loop gain, they will have quite a mixed um, sleep apnea. They will have many obstructive sleep apneas, but also many central sleep apneas. Higher loop gain defines less stable control as a disproportionately large ventilatory response will result in a greater degree of hypocapnia, meaning that carbon dioxide levels are going too low, and subsequent reduction in ventilatory drive. So another factor here that's coming into play is that if we have breathing that is waxing and waning, in other words, you have individuals, they stop breathing, they're hyperventilating, they're stopping breathing, they're hyperventilating, or for example, they are mouth breathing, they will have periods of hypocapnia. And as a result, the neural drive to breathe is reduced. So it results in low central respiratory drive. And this in turn is associated with low upper airway dilator muscle activity and high airway resistance. So there is some feedback in terms of the role that carbon dioxide plays in also initiating upper airway dilator muscle opening, that there is some communication happening there. So when we're talking about high loop gain, we're talking about, you know, not just is it that the neural drive to breathe is reduced, but also that the activity of the upper air airway dilator muscles is affected. Ventilatory drive determines not only the activity of the thoracic pump muscles, but also the upper airway dilator muscles. Consequently, the upper airway is susceptible to collapse from carbon dioxide and therefore neural drive to the upper airway muscles is low. Thus, high loop gain contributes to perpetuating apneas. Now, we've seen earlier on that high loop gain affects approximately 30% of people with obstructive sleep apnea. So therefore, how can we change high loop gain? In my opinion, in my experience, it's really about changing the ventilatory response to CO2. And we can do that with breathing exercises. But the key is, it's breathing exercise that are normalizing breathing volume. In other words, we're having individuals reduce their breathing volume during wakefulness in order to create air hunger. And it, this in turn is reducing the ventilatory response to carbon dioxide. Obstructive sleep apnea that is driven by high loop gain may be more vulnerable to the cardiovascular consequences of obstructive sleep apnea. And of course, cardiovascular events, including high blood pressure, arrhythmia, tachycardia and sympathetic arousal, sympathetic activation of the body are symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea. It's currently not possible to recognize elevated loop gain in patients until a new paper came out just a few months ago. And this paper tested the hypothesis that elevated loop gain during sleep can be recognized using voluntary breath hold maneuvers during wakefulness. Now, with the Buteco method, we have been using breath hold time for the last 20, 30 years. Since 2002, I've used breath hold time during wakefulness to provide feedback of how the individual is actually breathing. So I measured their comfortable breath hold time, the control pause. Traditionally, your breath hold time was taught to provide an indirect measurement of end tidal CO2, and end tidal CO2 gives you a good approximation of CO2 in the blood. The breath hold time actually probably gives you more information on the chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. As the individual is holding their breath, carbon dioxide is increasing in the blood, and we're measuring the time that it takes for the respiratory center in the brain to send the first distinct impulses to the respiratory muscles to breathe. So individuals, for example, with a low breath hold time, they tend to have relatively hard breathing. And the whole premise of this was that somebody coming into me with sleep disorder breathing. I would measure their breath hold time, but I'd also look at their breathing. I would look at the amplitude of the breath. I would look at the speed of the breath. I would look at the regularity of the breath. 
I would look at the natural pauses between breaths. And from that, it's gonna give me some idea of the extent of the negative pressure created during breathing and how that in turn then is contributing to their obstructive sleep apnea. So in this paper here, they look at 20 individuals, 10 had obstructive sleep apnea and 10 controls. And they had them participate in a single overnight study with voluntary breath holding maneuvers performed during wakefulness. They assessed two things. Number one was the maximum breath hold duration. So basically, how long did the individual hold their breath for up to a maximum? The second was that they looked at the ventilatory response in the first two breaths following a 20 second breath hold. Higher loop gain during sleep was associated with number one, a shorter maximum breath hold duration and number two, a larger ventilatory response to 20 seconds of a breath hold during wakefulness. As a clinician, any person who is presenting with obstructive sleep apnea, measure their control pause. If you feel comfortable, also measure their maximum pause, but just bear in mind that if we are having somebody with obstructive sleep apnea measure their maximum pause, it will increase their blood pressure. And if they are already predisposed to high blood pressure, we have to bear that in mind. But individuals in general with obstructive sleep apnea will have a lower breath hold time. For some individuals, they may have blunt echema receptors, so they could actually present with a relatively high breath hold time, but when you look at their breathing, you see that their breathing and their pattern of breathing isn't matching their breath hold time. You don't come across so many individuals um, presented with blunted chemo receptors. So this paper, together these factors combined to predict high loop gain. In other words, the exaggerated response to minimal increases in carbon dioxide. Chemo reflex sensitivity, which is a key determinant of loop gain, can be measured simply by measuring how long participants can voluntarily hold their breath for. And there's also evidence that factors influencing loop gain might be conserved from wakefulness to sleep. For example, greater chemo sensitivity during wakefulness is associated with central apneas during sleep. Now you're measuring chemo sensitivity and you're measuring the individual's response to the buildup of CO2 by looking and measuring their breath hold time. So again, just to repeat it, but patients that are coming in with obstructive sleep apnea measure their control pause. It may also be helpful to measure their maximum pause. And it's the feedback from that which will tell you the chemo sensitivity to carbon dioxide. So individuals with a low breath hold time, low control pause, low maximum pause, these individuals will have a greater chemo sensitivity to carbon dioxide. The third phenotype that we're looking at is called arousal threshold. And arousal threshold is the propensity to arouse from sleep. In other words, do you have an individual who is a relatively light sleeper? And if they are a light sleeper, that it doesn't take very much stimuli to wake them up out of sleep. If, for example, they are having a restriction to breathing, how much stimuli created during the restriction to breathing is taking them up out of sleep? If individuals are waking very, very easily, they will have a low arousal threshold. So individuals with a low arousal threshold might arouse before the dilator muscles are able to open the airway. So basically, we need the upper airway dilator muscles to do their job during sleep, to keep the airway open. But if individuals are waking up too easy, they're waking up before the upper airway dilator muscles have a chance to reopen the airway. Continual and necessary arousals can worsen obstructive sleep apnea and contribute to OSA pathophysiology, can perpetuate blood gas disturbances and cause sleep fragmentation to promote cyclical breathing and prevent establishment and maintenance of more stable, deeper stages of sleep and result in increased sleepiness. So really what we need is we need individuals to be able to achieve a deep sleep, that even if they have um, some events during sleep, that it's not continuously taking them out of the stages of deep sleep. Doctors traditionally, when they are treating individuals with low arousal threshold, um, provide sedatives. And sedatives might help to treat the condition if the upper airway dilator muscles are sufficiently responsive to respiratory stimuli to stabilize the airway before arousal. Now there's a number of things here that we should be taking into consideration. 
we really need to establish deep sleep and how can we do that? Number one is mouth breathing is generally going to result in light sleep. So an individual who is breathing through an open mouth during sleep, they tend not to achieve then the deeper stages that somebody with nasal breathing will do. Number two, if you have an individual who is breathing hard and fast, and especially if they're breathing through the mouth, they tend to be in fight or flight activation. Now, if you're in fight or flight, you're already in sympathetic activation. A normal individual, if they have a stressful event, they have a stressful day, something is going wrong, that person goes to sleep at night. And if their mind is agitated due to the stress that happened during the day, they will be twisting and turning all night. For sleep, we need activation of the parasympathetic response. We need the individual to be totally calm, to be totally relaxed, and for their breathing to be normal. Diaphragmatic breathing, slow breathing through the nose, and these factors help to achieve a deep sleep. So we looked at low arousal threshold, and basically these individuals, they, they are waking from sleep very, very easily with the slightest of stimuli. Another issue is those individuals who are really, really deep sleepers and they're stopping breathing and they have a high respiratory arousal threshold. These individuals will often have prolonged apneas, um, especially when it's combined with poor upper airway muscle responsiveness. So there's a combination going on. You know, we, we're looking at arousal threshold, but we're also looking at upper airway recruitment. Obstructive events that are terminated by arousal especially if you've got one with high arousal threshold. This results in a greater degree of hyperventilation and consequent hypocapnia and reduction in ventilatory drive, including the drive to the upper airway muscles. So here what you're looking at is individuals with high arousal threshold and if they also have high loop gain, it means that they're going to hyperventilate and this will result in hypocapnia the neural drive to breathe is reduced and as a result then it initiates a central sleep apnea but also of course with low CO2 with hypocapnia the upper airway dilator muscles um, don't work as effectively so it's almost that you know we're talking about four phenotypes but they're all interplaying with each other and with breathing re-education as I said at the very start we can influence and we can assist with Regardless, if a patient is coming in with a propensity to, towards arousal threshold or if they have high loop gain or even upper airway recruitment. And in terms of that, you know, it is about myofunctional therapy. Um, but re breathing re-education, diaphragmatic movement, when we move to that section, you'll see also the interplay between breathing and upper airway muscle recruitment. So just arousals may perpetuate successive obstructions. A high arousal threshold aroused by more negative pressure appears to develop in many patients with obstructive sleep apnea as an adaptive mechanism. As a greater magnitude of both negative pressure stimuli and chemo stimulation can accumulate to recruit upper airway dilator muscles to terminate the event before arousal. Now basically this would be that we do see from time to time individuals presenting with obstructive sleep apnea, but they have blunted chemoreceptors. That the chemoreceptors in the brain are not responding to the accumulation of carbon dioxide. Now, it's difficult to determine an individual who has blunted chemoreceptors. But one thing that we do notice, when we have them do the breathe light exercise, when we have them reduce their breathing, they have difficulty feeling air hunger. You have individuals, you know that they're slowing down their breath, you know that they're reducing their breathing volume because you see less movement, but they don't feel air hunger. And for me, it's, it's given me some feedback that these individuals may have blunted chemoreceptors. Individuals with blunted chemoreceptors, when they do go in a CPAP machine, their AHI index will reduce as a result of the continuous positive airway pressure, which is effectively splinting open the airway during sleep. And with a reduction to the number of apneas and hypopneas, the central chemoreceptors become more functioning. The fourth phenotype that we are looking at is upper airway recruitment threshold. So upper airway recruitment threshold is the magnitude of stimuli which is required to recruit the upper airway dilator muscles to overcome the pressure that's created during breathing. So basically, upper airway recruitment threshold, it refers to 
the functioning of the upper airway dilator muscles. Are they doing their job effectively? Are they keeping the airway open? You know, because as I said at the very start of this presentation, I said it's almost that there is a battle happening. There's the negative pressure created during inspiration on one hand, and there's the upper airway dilator muscles, which are designed to keep the airway open. Poor upper airway muscle responsiveness increases the duration of obstructive events as greater stimuli are required to activate the muscles to terminate the obstruction. So we need, we need the upper airway dilator muscles. We need them working effectively. You know, so when the airway starts to collapse, that they can withstand and they can reopen the airway. And the sooner that they reopen it, the less the risk of obstructive sleep apnea. Approximately 30% of obstructive sleep apnea have poor genioglossus muscle responsiveness to airway narrowing during sleep. The human pharynx is unique in that it's a collapsible tube. So you can imagine a collapsible paper straw and if I breathe hard through it, the negative pressure created during inspiration is causing the walls of the straw to move inwards. Depending on the dynamic balance of the pressure and the neural drive to the upper air with dilator muscles, the human pharynx is vulnerable to collapse during sleep. So in terms of upper airway recruitment threshold, yes, there are gases that are playing a role. We talked already about carbon dioxide. If you're breathing too hard and that's causing a loss of too much carbon dioxide, it induces hypocapnia. And there is some communication that when there is a loss of carbon dioxide that the upper airway recruitment muscles are not adequately activated. A second role there could be nitric oxide. So nitric oxide, which is continuously released into the nasal cavity. And during inspiration, we're carrying that nitric oxide through the upper airways, into the pharynx, the larynx, into the trachea, etc. That nitric oxide is an aircrine messenger and could also be sending a message to the upper airway dilator muscles to stay open during sleep. A third factor is diaphragmatic movement. When we breathe through the nose, we activate the diaphragm more readily. When we're using the diaphragm, our main breathing muscle, there is an increase to lung volume. And when there's an increase to lung volume, there's a stiffening of the throat. There are over 20 muscles involved in the upper airway, and they are involved in both respiratory and non-respiratory tasks, such as speech, mastication, swallowing, and breathing. But a subset of these muscles also play a role in airway stability during breathing. Many patients, they have a high recruitment threshold to respiratory stimuli during sleep that is not reached without awakening from sleep. Conversely, others are able to restore airflow during sleep via pharyngeal muscle recruitment without having an arousal. Now, in terms of the upper airway recruitment, we did speak about the importance of carbon dioxide, nitric oxide, diaphragm movement, and also strategies to improve the pharyngeal muscle function include regular didgeridoo playing and myofunctional therapy exercises. These strategies can reduce snoring and obstructive sleep apnea severity, a 50% reduction in the apnea hypopnea index and daytime sleepiness. Poor upper airway recruitment interacts with arousal threshold and loop gain to contribute to repetitive apneas. And the gas, as we spoke about, nitric oxide appears to play a role in maintaining the patency of the upper airways as a transmitter between the nose, the pharyngeal muscles, and the lungs. Nitric oxide is produced in significant quantities in the nose and in the paranasal sinuses. Nitric oxide is continuously released into the nasal airways. The concentration is dependent on the flow rate by which the sample is aspirated. Thus, nasal nitric oxide concentrations are higher at lower flow rates. This really comes back to breathing as well, because if we are breathing hard and fast, the concentration of nitric oxide that we're taking in into the airways is going to be reduced. For example, during nasal breathing, the concentration of nitric oxide is between 50 to 200 parts per billion. Mouth breathing, the concentration of nitric oxide is 10 parts per billion. If we are breathing regular and slow, there's a higher concentration of nitric oxide and as nitric oxide is a signaling and an aircrine messenger, it can also be playing a more effective role in terms of upper airway recruitment. So both nitric oxide and carbon dioxide, they act as aircrine messengers. Physiological, epidemiological and clinical evidence support 
a unified airway model. Nitric oxide plays a role in the maintenance of muscle tone, regulation of the neuromuscular pathways in the pharyngeal muscles, spontaneous respiration and sleep regulation. And this is a 2014 paper. And in general, the role of nitric oxide in the regulation of nasal obstructive sleep apnea, although probably significant, is still not completely understood. Now we have to bear in mind that nitric oxide was first discovered on the exhale breath of the human being only in 1991. So it's still relatively a recent phenomenon. And researchers in sleep, they are accrediting the gas as playing a role in sleep, but it's not fully realized exactly what that role is. Tying in the phenotypes with breathing patterns. PCRIT was the first one that we looked at, and this is the pressure at which the upper airway collapses during sleep. We need to open up the airway. We need to improve the anatomical structure of the upper airway, and we can do that when we have our lips together and we're breathing through the nose. In addition to breathing through the nose, we also need to have correct tongue resting posture. As I said earlier on, the tongue has got two places to be, one, it's in the roof of the mouth, or negatively, it's falling back into the throat. So with lips together, we also have stabilization of the jaws. Conversely, when the mouth is open, the jaw is falling back, and of course, tongue is falling back, and it's going to compromise the upper airway. The second phenotype that we looked at is loop gain. Individuals with high loop gain, they have an exaggerated ventilatory response to minimal changes in carbon dioxide. We need to reduce the ventilatory response to CO2, and we do that by giving the individual breathing exercises, slowing down their breathing to create air hunger. We know they are making progress when their control pause is increasing. Individuals with high loop gain have a low breath hold time. The third phenotype that we looked at is arousal threshold. How easy is it for the individual to wake up out of sleep? We want to achieve deep sleep. Deep sleep is typically achieved when we're breathing in and out through our nose, we're breathing lightly, and we're using our diaphragm. Conversely, mouth breathing, fast breathing using the upper chest is activating the sympathetic nervous system. The individual is in lighter sleep and the propensity to arouse out of sleep is going to be much greater. The fourth phenotype that we looked at is upper airway recruitment. How do we get the upper airway muscles doing their job more effectively? We spoke about the benefits of nitric oxide, we spoke about having normal CO2, and also the connection between the diaphragm and the upper airway dilator muscles. Each phenotype is intertwined, and with that, breathing is playing a role with each. And as a result, you know, no matter what treatment mode that you're using with your patient, we also need to look at breathing.